Okay, well, I think maybe we're gonna get started. Um, I'd just like to say good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to the Artist Archives of the Western Reserve. And I very much want to thank and welcome our panelists who have agreed to be part of this program this morning. Our mission here at the Archives is to collect representative bodies of work by Ohio artists and to make them available to the public for exhibition, uh, through exhibition and programs like this one and for research purposes. The program that you are going to participate in today is part of our Art Bite series of Art and Context lect Lectures, which is designed to work in conjunction with our exhibitions. And this program is part of our Bridges and Barriers exhibition, which is up right now in our gallery space here at the Archives. It'll be up through November 19th. It features photography by Shooting Without Bullets, by Lauren Pacini, Chuck Mintz, Jeff Janis, and the late Stephen Bivens. Um, our gallery is open to the public Wednesday through Friday from 10 to 4 p.m. and Saturdays from 12 to 4 p.m. We do ask that you wear masks, and right now nobody's here, but if somebody comes in, I do have a mask to put on. Um, I'd like to thank our funders who fund the archives, the voters of Cuyahoga County through Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, the Ohio Arts Council, the David Davis Foundation, the Zufall Foundation, the Gunn Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation. I'd also like to thank our board of directors, our members, our volunteers, and our staff. Our staff works very hard here. Um, you're seeing us all on the program today. Kelly Pantoni is our collection registrar. She's also our tech guru who's going to help us if we have any issues. And Megan Elves is our manager of programming and marketing. Megan's going to run the program for us today, and so I'm going to turn it over to her, and then I'm going to go silent. I'm going to mute myself and perhaps black myself out if people come in the gallery space. So, um, so Megan, take it away. Thanks so much, Mindy, and thanks, everybody, for coming today. I think this is going to be an amazing program um, that actually has some amazing topics, and kudos to everyone for showing up. They actually was mentioning earlier that we tried to boost the event on Facebook and were unable to because of social and political content. So consider yourself social warriors for being here. So I also, as first thing, order of duty, I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown of how Zoom works. I know we're all pretty familiar at this point, but just for some functionality. First off, there is the chat function. So if you're running a PC at the bottom of your screen, there's going to be a chat and a Q&A. So we'll be in a slightly different position if you have an iPad or a different Mac operating system. Now with the chat, you can have a drop down menu that says all panelists or all attendees or a panelist and attendees. So attendees, everybody can see it, panelists, just us. So feel free to put things in the chat, but we ask you to do it kind of sparingly, like it's class essentially. So you're not talking too much when everyone else is. Most importantly, there is a Q&A function, and that's at the bottom of your screen as well. When you click the Q&A, if you have a question for any of the panelists, go ahead and put their name and then put the question. I'll gather them up, and at the end of the seminar, I'll actually ask them for people. So please definitely do that. Outside of that, if you have any technical problems, feel free to put it in the chat. We'll be happy to address it. And now for the best parts, I get the honor of introducing Ms. Christy Copez, our moderator for this evening. So I'm gonna give you all the good details and then express some personal sentiments myself. Christy Copez, advocate artist, blogger, chronic illness warrior, coffee lover, dancing, dancer, foodie, grandmother, other mother, maven, phoenix, poetic essayist, veteran, and all around brazen woman. Christy Copez is recognized by the Tyrion of Network of Ohio and awarded the Tyrion Artist of the Year in 2017 to 2018. Tyrion seeks artists whose work promotes harmony with nature and all people, and whose life work align with their mission goals of creativity, healing, and peace. Christy envisions a nonprofit, Aruka Art, in the near future that supports living as a person of faith, notwithstanding chronic illnesses especially women who have come through trauma. Aruka Art will be a sacred space for creating a sense of spiritual, emotional, and physical resilience and vigorous well-being. She has earned her AA in Peace Studies and Conflict Resolution, so best monitor ever. 
her BA in studio art and is currently pursuing her master's degree in theology and pastoral studies. Christy resides in Cleveland, Ohio and enjoys spending her time with her grands and Ripley the grand dog. And on a personal note, Christy is an amazing woman and so important in the Cleveland art scene. She is strong, she is thoughtful, she is powerful, and it is a true privilege to have her do this conversation today. So without further ado, here is Christy to run this beautiful conversation with you. Wow, thank you, Megan. Hmm. Uh, one of the first things I wanted to do is make an acknowledgement. Uh, we want to acknowledge that the land that we stand on in the place that we call Cuyahoga County is land that was claimed by the United States government through force, displacement, and treaties negotiated in bad faith. We acknowledge those of the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, whose lands we stand on, and the thousands of Native Americans representing over 100 tribes who currently live in the Northeast Ohio area. I'm uh, really pleased uh, to be connected to the Artist Archive um, of the Western Reserve as an artist and as an executive board member. And there is crucial work that's being done that is centered around social justice, racial equity, and art. The archive is demonstrating their intention to foster equity through its concerted efforts to support artists of color and the greater Cleveland community through important exhibits, education, and panel discussions like this one. I'm your moderator for the afternoon and welcome to Through Our Lens, Photography as a Tool of Social Justice. And I'm gonna squeeze in a quick shout out. Um, my oldest grand is watching today and she just turned 14 today. Hey grand, all right. Um, I have the pleasure also of introducing all of our panelists. I'm going to start with Amanda. Amanda D. King is a Cleveland-based artist, activist, and educator. Her civically engaged practices utilizes social justice, art history, and photography to spread progressive ideas and messages of equity through art direction, image making, public art, and community organizing. Amanda is the founder and creative director of Shooting Without Bullets, a four impact organization working to eliminate systemic barriers that prevent black and brown youth from thriving. Utilizing cultural production, art education and development, activism and advocacy, Shooting Without Bullets models an alternative arts ecosystem that accelerates movement black and brown youth and their communities need to thrive. Amanda holds a bachelor's degree in art history from Ben Meyer College and a JD from Case Western Reserve University where she received the Martin Luther King Jr. Diane Ethics and Dean's Community Service Awards. Go right ahead, Amanda. All right. Wow, I'm the first person. Well, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Amanda, Amanda D. King, founder and creative director of Shooting Without Bullets. And it's wonderful to be here with Barbara and Nicole and Christy in the archives. Thank you for having us. Um, I want to, so Shooting Without Bullets is actually in the show right now, um, in the Bridges and Barriers show. And our installation, Keep Me Posted, is the is our contribution to the show and the images in in keep me posted um explore the precariousness of black life at this moment that has been heightened in the last uh eight months because of covid 19 because of state sanctioned violence and because of widening racial inequity and um but what the what the ex, what the document what the photographic documentation explores is movement through this precarious moment and movement as a force of resistance against it it's movement through our neighborhoods movement through daily life it's to aspire for racial equity to aspire for black liberation to aspire for um, social justice 
despite the circumstances. It's movement through the digital world. We know that we are increasingly having to connect with each other in a new way, which is digitally and electronically. And then also social movement. So movement against um, these unjust forces, movement against state sanctioned violence, poverty and inequity and movement for black lives. And so um, for this, uh, conversation today, I wanted to use some of those images from Keep Me Posted and talk to you about what I believe um, we're doing within Shooting Without Bullets. So of course we use photography as a tool of social justice, but I'd like to take that a step further and I would like to uh, take a few minutes to talk about what I believe is photography as a political right. And I'm thinking about First Amendment so freedom of speech, but I'm also thinking about those rights that are inextricable from citizenship, like the right to dignity and the right mm -hmm. to representation, and how through um, the camera, the young artists of Shooting Without Bullets and myself, we're, we're using, um, hold on, I'm gonna start the, the PowerPoint here before I get too far um, into this. Let me share my screen. Because I can get really excited and just, Start, start going. Okay. Um, so I, shooting without bullets uses the camera as a as an apparatus for representation, speech, documentation, expression, and and protest. And the images that I'm going to show you, I believe, um, represent this, uh, th and that the uses are. Um, organic, they're happening and they're happening concurrently. So um, a function of the photograph could be representation as well as protest, expression as well as documentation. Um, this is a, these are two photographs from Lele, bon Lele Bonner, who is an artist in the Shooting Without Bullets Artist Collective. We have an art, art artist collective of black and brown artists. Um, they're all currently 19 and 20 years old. And uh, this first image is of an, an essential worker and it's taken downtown Cleveland. And so Lele is both representing and putting a face to uh, the es essential worker who's working in the pandemic, who is often um, talked about, but who's maybe not represented in the media as much as they should be for as much sacrifice as they're giving to our society at this moment. She's documenting life within the pandemic, but she's also sharing um, a very reverent perspective and, and viewpoint on the way in which she values this individual. You see that she's shooting up, you know, to, to make him look strong and stately, to capture him as a hero in this moment. And what I find most striking about this image is that he's using the safety cone as um, as a pedestal, as something to rest upon. And Lele, as a photographer who studies and learns visual language, both through shooting without bullets and her own practice, and maybe has um, some understanding of art history, is sort of fashioning the, she's f fashioning this essential worker uh, very much in the context of formal, formal portraiture, but it is a street photograph. The next one is, um, uh, it's, it's a black black power graffiti downtown Cleveland near where the May 30th up, uprisings against state, state sanctioned violence in the name of George Floyd took place. And through this, um, Lele is obviously documenting the graffiti around the city, but she's also sharing her alignment and political viewpoint with the Black Lives Matter movement, which is the zeitgeist of this moment of, of global uprisings in the name of the sanctity of black life. And so, mm -hmm. so by taking that photograph, she's saying I'm aligning myself with this, but then also um, documenting, documenting graffiti, which is a subversive art form is essentially mm -hmm. also a form of protest and bringing that um, art that is out there in the street that is maybe not sanctified enough to be within gallery spaces, bringing that through the, the photograph is, is essential here. Uh, the second one uh, is Jasmine Banks, um, who's photographing her sister and her niece. And um, 
I, I love these images because they are the only, only images of interior space in, in the show. She's photographing, her approach to photographing her sister and her niece, there's so much in, intimacy, familiarity, and tenderness. And um, that, that, that care is something that is so important in shooting without bullets but it also reminds us of the sanctity of Black life at this moment and is a call to action to protect the lives of Black women. When you think that um, Ayanna Jones, a child was murdered in her home by the police, Tanisha Anderson, a woman not even 40 years old here in Cleveland, murdered by the police in her home, and now recently Breonna Taylor, um, Jasmine uh, um, taking these photographs in her home and bringing the viewer into that reminds us of the preciousness of Black life at the moment, but also why we resist against the forces that are threatening it. Um, this one is a, is, a, is a photograph that I took of, of, of Los P, who's a, who's, who's a hip hop artist in our artist collective. He's a bike enthusiast. And um, I, I share this, um, I share this to open up the larger conversation of choice, of intentionality. You know, when, when photographers use their camera, they're, they're communicate, they're, they're, they're using the apparatus to communicate something. And here I made very intentional choices about lighting. So the first one I'm using a, a, a wide aperture and a shallow depth of field. Um, and I knew that the, the natural light of the evening would kind of come and saturate the image and Los's beauty and quietude would just come out through that um, flood of light. But on the, on the counter, you know, I knew that I, I, I took another photograph, which was later in that evening, and I used um, the, the light of a street post. And I knew that my camera did not have a, a fast enough film speed to capture um, his his dark skin, and I knew that just his his T-shirt would be would be illuminated. And there's a different there's these these images evoke something different. And I always say to myself and young photographers that you have to understand the power and the sensitivity of this instrument because it can it can it can be an image of the same person and communicate something very very different and unless you know your aperture and your shutter speed you might think that you're taking an image on the left but you're actually taking an image on the right now i love both of these images and how they speak to one another but it is important in how we are using light and contrast and composition to represent represent people wow. especially in the context of social mm -hmm. justice and then the last one, um, I know we're gonna get into the conversation about protest art. I took this on May 30th at the, um, at the May 30th uprising mm -hmm. against state sanctioned violence. This is the Justice mm -hmm. Center um, in, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, where black mm -hmm. and brown folks are currently incarcerated. And this is where um, the protests move towards. And um, this is actually a video still, and I know we're not going to be talking about video today, but this was taken on my camera phone. And I was, a and I was able to capture this young man who was riding his bike through the intersection in, um, in front of where the, the um, burning cop car was located. And what I love about this image is the symbolism. So I am speaking in symbols here. And when you think about the conversation of tearing down monuments, many of those monuments um, that are for imperialism and white supremacy are these generals and these um, presidential figures who are mounted on horses, right? Who have rained terror on, on black and brown folks and, and communities. Uh, and, and this is kind of a counterpoint. Um, he's, he's doing a wheelie, he's mounting his bike and he's, He's navigating through a different battleground, which is the streets of Cleveland, Ohio, during a protest mm -hmm. and an uprising. And so I think it's important. Um, I, I wanted to show this image because I do think it's a symbol of victory. I think that us just moving through this precarious moment is something that people needed to see. And while I was at that May 30th protest, I was there in solidarity with my people. I was not there to photograph. I had my camera phone, I had my 
uh, 35 millimeter on my hip, but I also had a backpack full of aid. You know, I also had my constitutional mm -hmm. rights book, right? Because I was there to, um, I was there to physically resist and I captured this um, photograph in the process. And I guess if you say, well, if someone asked me, well, let, what, did the, what photos did you take on May 30th? This is the image that I want you to see. Um, I, I don't want you to see the state. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give the state um, more authority over what I'm seeing. I, I, I don't want to um, necessarily show the brutality. I, I think that we need to see a vision of new. We need to see Black people winning in this moment. And, and certainly, mm -hmm. last thing I'll say is, from an ethical standpoint, I did not want to show this individual's face. I do not believe that we have we we should know who this person is and and of course it's at a protest so I couldn't stop this individual and say hey can I use can I use this picture and so the blurring is a way of protection but it's also a way of withholding the white gaze if you weren't there at the May 30th protest you don't get to see it all so that's sort of my presentation wow. there Thank you, Amanda. Wow. Um, I'm sitting here smiling and so excited about all of your comments because um, it looks like you just ran right down all my questions and things I wanted to probe a little bit. So I so appreciate you opening it up this way. Um, the next person that I'm going to bring up is Barbara Tannenbaum. Barbara Tannenbaum is chair, prints, drawings, and photographs and curator of photography at the Cleveland Museum of Art, has organized over 125 exhibitions during her four decade career as curator and academic. Current exhibition projects include Isle Bing, Queen of the Lika, and Bruce Davidson, Brooklyn Gang. From 1985 through 2011, Tannenbaum was chief curator at the Akron Art Museum, where she acquired numerous works by a di diverse group of local, national, and international artists, including growing the photography collection from 500 to 2,500 works. She has authored numerous publications, including books on T.R. Erickson, Ralph Eugene Meatyard, and the Akron Art Museum's collection and lectured throughout the U.S. and in Canada, Brazil, and China. Barbara, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take my cue from one of the prompts that uh, Christy thoughtfully sent out to us, and that's the question, do images have power to enact cultural or societal change? And I'm going to then share my screen with you, um, hopefully. Hopefully this will work. And I think there it's working, I hope, hopefully. You're getting a PowerPoint image um, of Jacob Reese's um, image. And it really, uh, social documentary photography wasn't used particularly, to, didn't really exist until the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem was that there was no way to easily reproduce photographic images. But Jacob Reese, who was a journalist and a mm -hmm. photographer and a social reformer, um, was very concerned about the situation of the slums in New York and other cities. And he went around and photographed in the slums. But as you can see on the right, when he went to publish his documentary images in Scribner's Magazine, which was a very popular magazine at the time, um, it, they didn't reproduce photography. It was too expensive, too cumbersome. And um, so they had to translate his images into um, these line engravings. Uh, nonetheless, he did sort of get the word out and he also did lectures because he found uh, magazines to um, not reach a wide enough public. And so that's one of the things to think about is not just making the images, but distribution, getting your messages out. And that's been an issue of documentary photography forever. Um, Lewis Hine, who was uh, also a social reformer and photographer, was influential. In fact, his images may have really sold the bill of getting rid of child labor, of passing a labor act, which at least ensured that um, if you were under 14, you couldn't work. And if you were over 14, you only had to work an eight hour day. Um, but he went around to cotton mills to uh, news, photograph newsboys, uh, people who were shucking oysters, and children routinely worked in those days, and little children. And um, so his images 
which were in the National Child Labor Relation um, Committee uh, images in their journals. He published them in their journals, but he also tried to get some broader exposure for them. And he also lectured and made posters. And it actually led to the changing of the law and the fact that we now don't have children working anymore. Uh, it was really an amazing um, uh, act of social engineering through the use and the power of photography, because even though people knew children work, when they saw the conditions, when they saw the children's uh, small stature and their injuries, uh, it changed everybody's opinion. And eventually they got the political clout to change the law. Um, I'm going to skip forward to the 60s and the civil rights demonstrations. And there were many different forces um, documenting these and using photography in different ways. Um, and of course, one of those was the press, the general press. And while there were a number of photojournalists covering it, they represented all kinds of different uh, publications. But those who were sympathetic to the protests and the protesters and who were on the side of civil rights, even though they were theoretically impartial photojournalists and, and adhering to the laws of photojournalism, which calls for an ethic of impartiality, they nonetheless, in their work, evinced um, uh, public displays of what was going on. And those images, which appeared in newspapers and magazines throughout the United States and the world, helped change public opinion. However, you also have the, some of the organizations having their own photographers. And this is a work by Danny Lyon, who worked for um, uh, SNCC and was able to capture a number of images that didn't just document protests and sufferings, but it also documented the political and social aims and the nobility of the people who were involved in this protest. And this famous image of his, which was taken actually on the second day that he arrived down in the South uh, to work with Nick and, and put a photograph for them, uh, became a very famous poster called Come Let Us Build a New World Together. And it shows you the, the young woman in the middle surrounded by the two men on the left is John Lewis. Uh, the sadly um, departed John Lewis, who was just such an amazing person. And, um, but most of the people in SNCC worked together and in, instead of emphasizing uh, a single leader, they emphasized uh, a different role than some of the other organizations in that they believed themselves to be a community that worked together. And this poster exemplifies that. So it creates an image of the organization that's trying to bring about change and it is sort of an ennobling of those people, just as Amanda was talking about the ennobling of the essential worker. So it's very different than showing the sufferings and showing the protests uh, that involve violence and retribution. It is showing the nobility of the quest and, um, and the humility of the people who are trying to bring about social change. Um, one of the images that brought about social change in recent times, in the beginning of the 2000s, were the images of Abu Ghraib. And this brings us to the idea that in the age of the digital camera and of now cell phones, we have the citizen journalist. We have people who can take images and they don't have to be professional. They don't have to have access to modes of distribution through magazines, networks. But all of a sudden, anybody can put an image out there. And these images of the horrific tortures and um, things that were being done to the Iraqi prisoners in this prison in Abu Ghraib were um, instrumental in drawing attention to it. Now, there had been a great deal of knowledge. Since 2003, uh, there had been a, a report published about the atrocities that were going on and the abuse that was going on. The press knew about it. It was written about in the press in the early 2003s and early 2004s, but not until photos were published in 2004 did a public outcry arise and the power of the swell of public opinion caused the government to all of a sudden realize that it had to do something. So, you know, all of a sudden people who are, these were not intentionally released to bring about social change, but the fact that these images existed in the world and people saw them because they were digital. There was no original, they were just distributed. And probably some of the guards who took them sent them to their relatives, not intending for them to get out into the public. So again, we address this issue of distribution and control, but now we're in an age when anybody can be a citizen journalist. Anybody who releases this image or passes it on has um, the power to solicit and amass public opinion 
in favor of a certain view. And finally, the last image I'm going to talk about, I wanted to bring about the idea also that we use photography um, to create images of our heroes. And uh, this is just a wonderful a 1960s memorabilia of a framed picture of um, Martin Luther King and the Kennedys. But um, you know, this is something that um, we not only need demonstrations of the cruelty or the abuses that are going on, but we also need to have positive images that uplift us, that remind us that we need to um, bring about change and that those people who do so do so at a, at a risk and a cost, but they also um, have noble, noble thoughts and noble behavior that bring about good things. And so it's important to have, I think, these kinds of positive images and to be able to have people that we do hold up and have images of them so that it associates us. This is something we would hang in our home, whereas the images with the dogs or Abu Ghraib, of course, you're not going to put that over your sofa. But this is something that you can live with and see every day as a photographic reminder. And so that's just a very brief survey of a few issues in the use of photography as, um, as a means of um, uh, bringing about social change. And I'm sure we'll get into a media discussion later. Thank you, Barbara. Mm. I'm, I'm struck by the juxtaposition of some of those harsher and more provocative images um, against those dignified, um, subtle ones. So I really appreciate that. And yes, we will definitely get into that a little bit more. Uh, next up is Nicole Fleetwood. Nicole R. Fleetwood is a writer, curator, and Professor of American Studies and Art History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Professor Fleetwood's books are Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, Harvard University Press, 2020. On Racial Icons, Blackness and the Public Imagination, Rutgers University Press, 2015. And Troubling Vision, Performance, Visuality and Blackness, University of Chicago Press, 2011. She is co-editor of Aperture Magazine's Prison Nation, as well as co-curator of Aperture's Touring Prison Nation Exhibition. She has co-curated co -curated exhibitions and programs on art and mass incarceration at MoMA, PS1, and Andrew Friedman Home, Arpiture Foundation, Cleveland Public Library, Muir Arts Philadelphia, and Zimmerly Art Museum. Her work has been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, NYPL's Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, ACLS, Whiting Foundation, Deniston Hill Residency, Schomburg Center for Scholars in Residence, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the NEH. Go right ahead, Nicole. Thank you very much, Christy, for the introduction. And thank you to the Artist Archives for organizing this panel. And I'm really honored to be on it with my uh, co-panelists, Amanda and Barbara. Mm -hmm. and, um, thanks to Megan and Mindy and everyone involved in um, organizing this. So I, um, as um, Christy generously uh, said in her introduction, I'm um, the curator of an exhibition that's currently um, on view at MoMA PS1. And I just, in the, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just focus more on some images from um, the exhibition instead of talking about my broader book project. But if you have questions uh, during the Q&A, I'm happy to talk about it. What I would like to say is that um, the book, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, and the exhibition of the exact same title is a 10-year project. So I started working on this in 2010. I'm, I'm zooming in from um, Harlem, where I currently live, but I grew up in Ohio. I'm from Southwest Ohio, Butler County, and I'm from a part of Ohio that's been, a South, uh, Butler County that's been hyper-incarcerated. Um, most of my male cousins who grew up in that area have spent time in jails and prisons. And um, in 1994, my cousin Alan was sentenced to life and he at age 18 and I had grown up very, very close to him. And after 
um, and I had just graduated from college, Miami University. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. So like three weeks after I graduated, I was in a courtroom where he was being sentenced to life. And that was absolutely devastating for him, for my entire family, for me. What it led to was a commitment to um, staying in touch with each other through writing and through sending um, images, photographs. So over the course, at th and I have to say now, Alan's, Alan was released on parole. He served 21 years. He's out. He's doing very well. But over the 21 years he was in prison, I we wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters. And often in those letters would be images, images Alan would send from prison, images that I would send from my day-to-day -day life, from my travels. Um, and once a year, I would go to Ohio to visit him in prison. And we, um, many of you who might be familiar with prisons know that there's often provisional um, photo rooms, photo spaces, and visiting rooms where you can pose with your imprisoned loved ones. And so from these images, literally from these images to the, in 2010, I started analyzing them and thinking more about them beyond just my family and the entire project grew. I um, came in contact with hundreds and hundreds of artists, people, activists, people that have been directly impacted by mass incarceration. So the book is available if any of you are interested in reading it, you can order it on, at any online bookstore. Um, and what's been very exciting is to take the book of text and turn it into a um, 8,000 square foot um, exhibition at MoMA PS1. The show was scheduled to open on April 4th, but because of COVID, we had to postpone the exhibition to September 17th. Um, so I just want to walk you through a few of the images from the installation. It's a few installation shots from PS1. Um, this is one of the first, um, when you enter, we, because of COVID also, there's, we're at 25% capacity. You have to enter the gallery space in, in particular ways. There's eight rooms. The show takes up eight rooms. And so this is one of the first things you see when you walk into the room. Um, and I wanted to take you inside. So this is actually the cover of the book. Um, and you, you really don't get a sense of that from the cover. Let me just go back. This is the cover of the book. The cover is a, a series called Pyrrhic Defeat by Mark Lofney, who's currently in prison in Pennsylvania. And since 2014, he's been doing this ongoing series. All of these works uh, comprise just one art project called Siri, um, it's a series called Pyrrhic Defeat. He wants people, it's very important for him that we don't see these as individual works of art, but we see it as one work of art that's really documenting the collective toll of prisons and mass incarceration from the side of someone who's in prison. So Mark invites other imprisoned people to sit for a 20 minute um, sketch. And the, his sketches are remarkable. So these are all 20 minute sketches. And this is the most recent addition to the series. Um, during, he, he did this during COVID. We got these, these new works like three weeks before the show opened. And so there are dozens of images of, of graphite drawings of um, imprisoned men in, um, in COVID masks. From there, uh, you'll enter this room. And I'm just going to, there's a lot of great things happening in this room. But for interest of time, I'm going to zoom in on uh, the pedestal that's in the center, because that's an Ohio-based artist, Dean Gillespie. Some of you might know of him. He's on the board of the Ohio Innocence Project. I, I became acquainted with Dean and his work because he was imprisoned with my cousin Alan. And Dean is from a rural white rural part of Ohio. He's white. My cousin Alan is from more of a, a, a kind of in, a urban town. He's black. And I was very curious about this friendship that they created in prison. And part of it was through art and, you know, and, and um, just really crossing all the kind of racial and ethnic divides that often take place in prison. Um, and Dean actually, through his network, and he, he had friends of all races and ethnicities, he was able to acquire uh, materials to create these elaborate miniatures during his 20 years in prison in Ohio. And Dean was eventually released by the Ohio Innocence Project. He was wrongfully convicted. He was their inaugural case. And since then, he's gone on to do um, regional, national, and international work around wrongful conviction. He's very active with a um, ha helping some people in the Cleveland area, like Ray Ma Raymond Taller, get released from, from wrongful convictions. Um, here's another image from that same gallery room. 
so again, these are made, these, his miniatures are made over a 20 year period and, um, and they're really about a kind of nostalgic Americana. They often incorporate the nickname Spitz that his dad gave him. Um, on the walls, um, uh, the, the uh, perpendicular you see um, works by uh, Jared Owens, the one that looks like a, um, a ship. And it's actually uh, the Brooks, the iconic slave ship uh, that was used by abolitionists. It's called the Brooks Diagram from 1788. And over it, uh, over the overlay on the triptych is um, Ferriton Prison, where Jared Owens was actually imprisoned. So he's lined up the prison cells and the slave, the holding cells of slave ship, thinking about this long continu continuation of black captivity and oppression. Um, and then across from that is um, Gilberto Rivera's triptych on COVID, COVID-19. He was also in prison, he's now released. He's a construction worker. And this triptych on, about COVID is really thinking about the impact of COVID on frontline workers, especially black and brown communities um, who are most um, impacted by uh, severe illness and, and, and death. Um, and after you leave that room, you walk into this incredible installation. People are really wild by it. We d decided to install um, Jesse Crimes' Apocalyptic on a curved wall to give this, kind of give this feeling of being kind of it, it, it being actually wrapped in it. And um, Jesse was in prison with Gilberto and, and, and Jared, whose works I showed you in the last slide. They, they formed this. Um, um, art collective when they were in prison together. And it was a multiracial art collective. Jared Owens is black, Gilberto is Puerto Rican, Jesse Crimes white, and they would really support each other. They would resource pool, they uh, challenge each other, they teach each other's new techniques. And this work here by Jesse is 39 prison bed sheets um, uh, that where he's transferred images, a lot of photo-based photo images from the New York Times and from other magazines. Many people who know anything about prisons realize that in prison people very rarely have access to photography, which this um, is one of the um, subjects of this panel. Um, so they're often creating images that's in response to photography or dominant images that represent imprisoned people, often as counter narratives of, that's really about reclaiming their humanity. Um, here's an, after you leave that, you walk into this great room with uh, sculptures. Um, and I'm gonna, I, I can come back to some of these. Uh, the blue one the, uh, is by, uh, blue and gray one is by Sable Lee Smith, whose father, she's never been in prison, but her father was in prison when she was 10 and sentenced to life. So she does a lot of work around fragmentation in prisons, especially the fragmentation of black families. And so the blue knobs are meant to look like um, visiting room stools that she would sit on to visit her father. And across from that is a large, um, half ton sculpture by Daniel McCarthy Clifford, who was in prison. He's now out. He went on to get his BFA and then his MFA in fine arts after being released from prison. And this was part of his MFA thesis, where he's collected hundreds and hundreds of trays that look like something you would find in a mess hall of prison. So both of them are um, playing around, kind of um, experimenting with the, the materials of prisons in their sculptural work. Um, then I want to show you the photographs. I'm going to show you two more slides and then I'll end. The photographs of a um, uh, well-known African-American couple, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick. They're based in New Orleans. Um, they've been um, active for over four decades, making, um, um, taking photos of how prisons impact Black communities in Louisiana. And these are six works that they did um, of ang documenting Angola. Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the world. It's built on a former slave plantation. And in fact, many of the imprisoned people there today do the kind of work that enslaved people did two centuries ago, like for example, picking cotton by hand. Um, and so this is a part of a, a series they call slavery, the prison industrial complex, where they're linking, making links between slavery and uh, current issues around uh, mass incarceration. And for interest of time, I'm just gonna show you this last installation shot where you have these orange hoodies, part of a collaboration between girls in um, a youth detention center in Miami, Florida and artist Susan Lee Chun. And then on the wall behind it are photographs from 
Sarah Bennett, who was a criminal defense attorney and then became a photographer documenting the impact of long-term incarceration on women, especially women who are survivors of gender and sexual violence. So women who survive gender and sexual violence, sometimes uh, as a way of surviving, they harm or kill their abuser and then they get sentenced to life. So that's been her work for many years um, and I can talk more about that. But thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. I, I wanna thank you for sharing um, all of those images, but I have to go back to the very first one, um, sharing that personal image of Alan. And I thought, I wonder how many of us, me included, could literally identify with that image, with the effect on our families and standing in those rooms with those backdrops. So I really appreciate you um, showing that. Thank you. Uh, what I'll try to do now is just kind of move into the discussion part. Um, you all have given us such good meat to work with. Um, I think this is going to be great. Um, I'm going to start off with a quote just to kind of frame all of this. Um, and it is a quote by John Lubbock from his book, The Beauties of Nature and the Wonders of the World We Live In. And he was an English banker, a liberal politician, a philanthropist, scientist, and polymath, and who transitioned May 28th, 1913. And he says, what we do see depends mainly on what we look for. In the same field, the farmer will notice the crop, the geologist, the fossils, botanists, the flowers, artists, the coloring sportmen the cover for the game. Though we may all look at the same things, it does not always follow that we should see them. What we do see depends mainly on what we look for. I wanted to start there um, just to give us an opportunity to look at all of our different perspectives, all of our different experiences um, with photography, and yes, videos. I wanted to include that too, Amanda, and um, as this tool of social justice. So um, I'm going to start here. I wanted to ask you, all, and I'm going to start with you, Nicole, if you don't mind, no. um, but please, I want everybody else to jump in on this too. Um, does photogra photographic images and videos have the power to insta instigate cultural or societal change, um, empower solidarity, uh, maybe just bring awareness, or even be a vehicle to administer healing? If yes, how are images able to do this? I really appreciate that question. And yes, I do think that photography and visual images more broadly do have um, a huge place in cultural and social change. Um, I wrote a book, my second book was called On Racial Icons, mm -hmm. Blackness in the Public Imagination, and it's all about um, photography's role in mediating racial and political issues, especially over the, from the 19th century onward. And I really, you know, I was so struck by that very powerful steal um, by Amanda King that Amanda showed us of the, of, of, of what we might call a counter monument of the mm -hmm. young guy mounting mm -hmm. his bike. Uh, it was, it, it just really struck me. Um, and I also was struck by um, the, this overview that Barbara gave us of the history of social documentary photography. And um, anyone who studied Jacob Reese knows that that book actually led to policy changes, right? And um, the work of um, SNCC, and Danny Lyons and all the other great civil rights photographers, that brought about so much change because it created um, a broader sympathetic public. Um, seeing those images, especially white middle-class people who felt detached from many of the struggles of the South, they saw those images and they real, and it really transformed the support, the national and international support for the mid 20th century civil rights movement. So absolutely, I do think that images are enormously impactful 
for creating change. And even how I ended with the slides by Sarah Bennett, and I said she was a criminal defense attorney. Well, she went from criminal defense work to actually becoming a photographer because she said she realized she needed to use the camera to actually vis visualize the humanity of the people she was defending because the papers, the court documents and the like were not enough. They were just like statistics and names and it was through the use of the camera that she was able to create more of a complex humanity for people. Mm, thank you. Amanda or Barbara, did you wanna add on to that a little bit? Um, that question about, um, is it a vehicle to administer healing or empower solidarity? bring awareness, which way do you lean? Um, I also think that it can serve those purposes very well, but I wanna add something to um, all of the different points that Nicole made. And another thing is the fact that it memorializes. Mm. In other words, a photograph is something that will last, that image of those people or that action. And so in that way, it allows us to both be aware of the past and remember it, but also to honor it and to um, be moved by it. And so I think in that way, it can bring about healing and very positive behavior. And you know, when you think about a monument in bronze, you think about something that's gonna be there forever. But a photograph, because it can be infinitely reproduced without such huge loss of quality. I mean, now we tend to think in the art museum context that the photograph is an object, but the photograph is also an image. And in the, as an image, it can be reproduced endlessly. And so it can communicate the same message to a wide group of people and thus bring them together. So that's another way I, I think in which um, photography can serve to do those kinds of healing and um, community building services. Yeah, I would, I would just echo all of that and to say like photography has so many, it almost has infinite functions, functions of healing, functions of representation, functions of justice, functions of, of social change. And I think that for Black folks, we've always used the apparatus of the camera to further social movement, like the images that Barbara showed, but I always go back to, and of course what Nicole showed, but I always go back to um, this photography being a tool, an abolitionist tool, you know, Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth literally using the, the using the cameras to represent themselves as formerly enslaved people to claim their humanity to infinitely reproduce their dignity when it was so unjustly taken away from them but also to say listen y'all th this enslavement is happening across the united states and that th this photograph of myself who made it out is going to be a tool that is going to fund abolitionist movement. And so I always go back to that. And I think about, you know, the, the, uh, the drawings that Nicole showed and how the, the in, incarcerated individuals were representing them, themselves and that reproduction is now uh, a tool of raising awareness in, in, in a cultural institution and so on and so forth. And so, it's a very, very powerful tool for people of color, and we must use this tool in our, in our quest for citizenship, really. Um, one thought to add to that is that also people like um, Sojourner Truth use those photographs to raise money, just as SNCC did with the poster. So we can actually support the sale of those images can help support further progress. Wow. Um, I actually wanted to get personal with the three of you, if you don't mind. Um, I wanted to know, um, do you see yourselves as having a particular role or responsibility or mission in your work? And if so, if you could expound on that. And Barbara, can I start with you? Um, sure. Yes, okay. As, a, okay. as a curator, um, you know, I feel that um, I have um, a, a big responsibility to represent um, diverse viewpoints to bring um, an accurate view of the history of art, which is itself very diverse, and um, the history of photography to the gallery where we show photography, um, to give voice to um, a, a wide variety of viewpoints, to let people see themselves in the gallery, to have representations um, when they walk in, so that I, I try actually 
um, if there is a, a way to do it, to have images of African Americans or other people of color in an exhibition so that when people walk in, they see themselves and they feel at home. Um, but I think it's also a big responsibility in terms of, I mean, I think of myself as, um, I'm not in, in, in the role as curator, now I do sometimes do other kinds of writings and presentations, but in my role as curator, um, I have to accurately represent the history of photography and the ways it's been used, but that is so myriad and so broad that I think that um, that allows for a wide variety of kinds of expression. Um, I also think I have a responsibility to, um, to show local, national, and international artists to bring people from um, outside of our universe here and expand the things that people can see and, uh, and also to represent local and national artists so that we honor our own. Nicole or Amanda? Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel a responsibility in my work. And I also, for me as an academic and curator, I'm always, connect, I'm always um, committed to bringing my personal experience, like my family stories, into my research and scholarship. And I think it's really especially for important for people who have been written out of certain histories and certain fields and institutions to bring our entire legacies into that so that we're rewriting that hi history. So we're bringing people into conversations who have been deliberately excluded from those conversations. Yeah, as an image maker, I, I identify with bringing people in and I identify to that previous uh, conversation that we had about images raising awareness. But I think as an educator, right, as a creative director of Shooting Without Bullets, I think that's very important to have, to, to for photography to be an accessible tool to black and brown youth in our communities that that be a, an additional voice box for them to share their perspective, for, for them to express themselves, for them to learn a trade, for them to sell their work, to get commissions, to have money in their pockets, to do what they do. I think that photography allows for infinite possibilities. You know, through um, Mindy and Megan seeing the photographs that we, you know, we, we took in the exhibition, I'm here on a panel and I'm able to articulate my viewpoints and perspectives. It's a gateway and it's an entry point for so much. And I think that um, black and brown youth have a right to, uh, have a right to photography. I, I, I want to go back to that concept of it being a political right. Everyone who is in the United States at this moment should have some way of documenting some some access to a camera. It might not be, you know, a Leica camera, but it should be at least a camera phone or something because documentation is so important. How these uprisings happened in the names of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor was largely from that video of George Floyd being choked to death. And it's not that, and it's not that um, I believe that we should see images like that all the time, but it was the fact that the camera apparatus captured that and it became widely disseminated that opens the floodgates of, of, of conversation. I love how you speak about that right. Um, and, and that brings me to another thought. Is it important or does it matter? Does it make a difference if these art pieces through photography or video are from a professional artist or someone with intention or a bystander? Um, and should there even be a distinction? I mean, how do we count um, these images um, from who they are from? Anyway. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's a great question. And I don't, for me, there's not one answer to that. But I do think we're living in a world where there's just more and more image making and we have access to that technology. We have access to often really highly, you know, very powerful cameras on our phones, right? That, you know, even, you know, 10 years ago it was not as ubiquitous as it is now. Definitely not 20 years ago. So we have expanded just the, the image making. The world of image making has expanded voluminously in the past generation. 
Um, and some of the images that have um, garnered the most, in some of the images, photos and videos that have garnered the most attention in contemporary era have been done by people who are not professional photographers or professional video makers. And I'm thinking, even thinking of like the Eric Garner, I can't breathe. Or I'm thinking of, um, you know, Philando Castile's fiance who FaceTime live his murder, right? So those, so, um, but, but I think it's also really important for, you know, I think it's so, and often we talk about those images, not the images that are specifically around anti-Black violence, but the images that we have on our phones and of our friends and loved ones as like vernacular images and, and set up this divide between vernacular and fine arts or vernacular and, uh, and the museums. And I think that gets more complicated and especially a lot of contemporary Black photographers are working against those divides because partly those divides just play, play into like the history of museums as these gatekeeping spaces. I think Amanda gave some really excellent examples of that from, from the organization, the group that she's involved in, in, what is it, Shooting Without Bullets, you know, about the use of kind of art historical knowledge and photographic formalism, but playing with also snapshot and vernacular images, which are much more prominent and common, especially among non-white people. Anybody else wanted to add to that or their thoughts on it? I know that is a, a big question. Yeah, um, I mean, I agree with what Nicole said. There's not a single answer, but I think that there are, um, taking it back to what Amanda was saying, it's not just uh, that people have a right to have a camera and to be able to document, but if you are there and you see something, you have a responsibility. And so there's both the importance of the image of being there at the time and seeing something, and capturing it, and in that way, an image, as Nicole was saying, can become the key image for an event, can become a rallying point. Um, I do think that people who have training, and that's the, the beauty of shooting without bullets, is training people to be more effective visual communicators. And you know, there is a difference in many cases between um, sending somebody who is a, a trained, photographer who can capture an image that sums up so much like Amanda's in, in one scene. Um, whereas somebody who is not trained may not have as potent or as sort of concentrated an image, but it can still have power in and of itself. And I think, again, this gets back to the question of distribution and it's an interesting and thorny question for which I'm not sure right now there's an answer is which images belong in museums? How do things get preserved for history? because that's the downside of having so many images and having them all be digital, is that we are losing many of them to history. Whereas in the past, if you took a camera, took a photograph and you printed it, it had a chance of surviving and ending up in a historical society or a family album. And so I think it raises all kinds of interesting issues about um, what happens to those images, especially the ones that are taken by non-professionals and how do we get them into the historical record? Yeah, I get a little bit bothered about the conversation of who is a photographer because I think that there's a lot of elitism and sort of notions of like white-led notions of what is art within that. But I, I think that everyone should have the right to enjoy taking pictures to have again the ability to take pictures at their disposal because like to you know uh if you have a contract and you need to get it signed and over to someone you're oftentimes photographing that document you know to send so it's it's a functional use but i think like photographer there's there's a there's a number of different factors and elements that play into whether you're you're taking pictures or being a photographer. And I'm still trying to decide that, but I know that um, with Shooting Without Bullets and our educational praxis, it's everyone comes into the door that you have the potential to be a photographer. Barbara, you said something about uh, responsibility and I wanted to ask you a little bit deeper about that. Um, are you saying that photographers who are intentional and professional um, have the responsibility or are you saying anyone that may capture um, these images, especially police brutality, um, 
do they are they considered responsible? I think everybody, the, uh, if you're if you're on a if you are, um, you know, if you are someplace where you see something going on, and you have the ability to document it, yes, I do think you you do have a responsibility to do that if you can. Um, you know, I think that that's um, the other side of the coin, and I do think that. Um, you know, everybody in the sense is a photographer. It's like the distinction between fine art photographers and photojournalists, all of those distinctions are porous and anybody can make a really great image. But, you know, if you are the person on the spot, so much of, of what we think of as photojournalism is being at the place at the time. And whether you're a photographer, you think of yourself as a photographer, whether you're a professional or not, um, I think if you're at the place at the time and you can take a photograph, and disseminate it, you should. I'm not sure um, if I feel compelled to disseminate those images as a bystander who that would be the place I would fall in. Um, I wonder if so many of these images, especially when some kind of brutality or our insane act is happening in front of us and we automatically pick up our cell phones and take these images, you know, is it just our effort to record this, to have some evidence? Is it our effort to maybe feel like we are helping the situation by documenting it? Um, and then the question does come of, you know, what do we do with these images? Um, we can post them and maybe hope that they get some traction and make a difference. Um, what do you all think about that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I like that question. And I think about like Gordon Parks, right, who's like one of the most well-known, not just black photographers, but photographers of the 20th century. Um, and um, early, over the summer, I was on a panel about his work because there's gonna be an exhibition of some of his um, crime photograph uh, photographs that um, will be opening at MoMA in, in a series called The Atmosphere of Crime. And he said that he used his camera as his weapon. And he says a weapon against inequality, a weapon against all kinds of classism, racism, you know, all kinds of societal ills. And I do think, I mean, I, I, I agree with Barbara to an extent around the fact that there is, you know, there is a distinction between people who are formally trained um, and who have um, access to like a, a kind of photographic history and, you know, a kind of archive, right? And even a mental archive of, of images. I don't think that those images are necessarily more powerful because of that, but I do think there is something about people who commit to using like Gordon Parks, the camera as their tool, and they go in, in in many ways with an agenda. And I don't think that's a bad thing. They go in because they're very concerned about, you know, capturing certain aspects of life and really um, have, ha they have a, um, a perspective on that like Gordon Parks if you see a Gordon Parks photograph you know it's a Gordon Parks photograph he ha he he has an aesthetic he has a way of rendering um, social inequalities um, and so there to me is something different about um, a person who commits to that and their life journey is about using a tool a technique a medium for that kind of documentation. I think about somebody like Ava DuVernay who's doing that with film, right? And it's not to me, it's not the same as someone shooting a film on the street with their friends. To me, it doesn't, there's not a hierarchy there. And I am against creating hierarchies around whether something's vernacular, someone's trained or untrained, because that would exclude many of the artists in my show. I'm not interested in those hierarchies. But I do think that that often these images are operating in different realms and they're being consumed in very different ways. And I'm going to throw this to Amanda. It looked like you're chomping at the bit to get on the end of that. I'm looking at the clock and this is gone so quickly and we want to make sure that we leave some time for the Q&A. So Amanda. You want me to answer the question? Yeah, if you want to, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. I mean, well, the documentation of Black death or trauma, 
is sometimes important in the context of evidence. So if you're seeing it in the moment happen, that you capturing it on your camera could help, you know, could help in, in, in court, or it could at least help in the court of public opinion. Um, the issue is, is that we have to have knowledge and understanding around how those, how the re, um, this, this large dissemination of images and our reinterpretation of these images can uh, inflict trauma on, on Black folks and in our communities. And so I, I, I think that it's fundamentally different for me to um, photograph a, a moment of police brutality as it's happening and then to go ahead and do some type of Andy Warhol treatment, you know what I'm saying? And then have the, it in blue and black and orange and yellow and then mount it at the artist's archives. That, that becomes a different use and function of that image, which a lot of black artists are gra grappling with right now is can we reinterpret, can we reuse these and reappropriate these images? But I, th I think it's important from an evidence standpoint. I just wanna touch on protest photography and, and the presence of non-Black photographers passively being there to capture the moment and the complications of that. Um, the fact that, you know, yes, we need documentation of what is going on here, but there definitely is a voyeuristic appeal to seeing a ton of um, non-Black photographers at these protests getting these cool shots and these angles when we as black people like our lives in that moment are threatened and even me as a black photography even if i just had my camera there and just went to photograph which i would never do because i am an activist but even if i just went to photo i would still be in so much more danger um th than that white photographer and so i've i've had friends who have grappled with this and um we've been in conversation with and and i had one friend I won't mention his name, but he literally donated film to me and was like, I'm not going to photograph protests anymore. Like, if you choose to do that, go ahead. I'm going to be giving you film, you know, so that you can do that because I feel uncomfortable with, with that relationship. So it's a very interesting conversation that I don't think that there's a, there's a perfect answer to right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and what I'm hearing from all of these comments and, and thoughts about this subject is protest art can be raw. It could be peaceful and healing. It could be beautiful. And it definitely could be transformational. So I wanted to throw it to the q and If anyone has any questions right now. Yeah, thank you. This is amazing. I kind of imagined this would happen that I would want this conversation to go on forever, this powerhouse of people. So I'm going to hit a couple of highlights of the questions uh, before 2.30. I'll try to be respectful of people's time and then we'll wrap it up at 2.30 and I'll throw it to Mindy for closing, Christy for closing remarks and then Mindy. So the first one I have is actually for Barbara Tannenbaum. And it is, Barbara, do you feel photography has a greater impact in one era over another? Or has it been important in every period since every period has its iconic images? Um, I think that that uh, relates to the history of photography and its ability to be disseminated and distributed or reproduced so that when images were still one of a kind as, as in daguerreotypes in the early days, um, they had a much more limited impact even as uh, we began to have photography that could be printed on paper from a negative and replicated until it could be disseminated in print and therefore widely disseminated. I think it had less impact. Mm. Uh, I think from then on it's had an interesting um, trajectory because it, it's, it's had um, a strong impact but often a kind of different impact. So that now when we almost all of us have cell phones and we have the ability to, um, to make images ourselves, and there are so many more images out there. Um, it's changing the way we respond to the photographic image. It's, it dominates our life in every way, shape, and form, in that everywhere we look, basically, um, there is some kind of photographic image from our computer screen to billboards to magazines to TV. But um, there's so much that then the question becomes, can any one image hold sway? And uh, that's something that we're living through now and sort of 
rethinking and re-experiencing in a new way. Now, I think that's that's so poignant, especially the idea that so much of this conversation is an issue of dissemination and and distribution of images and photography's unique ability to do that. So really, that is interesting that, yes, photography existed in many eras, but its unique its impact can be uniquely tied to how far can that image get and how many people can see it, too. So thank you so much. Um, the next one, actually, I'm going to have, I have for Nicole Fleetwood. So this one is actually uh, concerning, um, so the ability of prisoners to actually represent themselves. So uh, Nicole, I know that the question was concerning, do prisoners have the ability to represent themselves? I'm assuming not through photography because of access, but through art. And do you think that if they had the, ac the ability to access photography, that it would somehow help in this notion of rehabilitation, which is, a, which is a very troublesome notion to begin with. So for the representation of prisoners in art. I'm I was trying to pull back up my um, Oh, you got it, good. Okay, but I can't pull it. It's for some reason, it's not letting me go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, no. Um, I wanted to show you all specific images from the PowerPoint around that. But so one of the ways that that um, imprisoned people, um, I really love that question, address it is through, um, there's a really active portraiture um, practice inside prison. So a lot of, well, yeah, let me put, now I can pull it up. Um, and so I wanted to show you a few examples of that, of the portrait work, including, um, so this is a rare image of a um, from a photo workshop um, program that took place in a prison outside of DC in the 80s, and where in, in prison people were also given access to um, to the dark room, um, and it's a self portrait where Michael Moses L is also you know looking at all these images of his beloveds, and I just I really really love this image here. Um, and then there's a couple of other examples of just different types of ways that portraiture work. Um, this is Jesse Crime's Purgatory series, um, which he t repurposed images from um, magazines like mugshots and celebrity headshots and transferred on them onto the prison bars of soap. So these are like 292 of them. Um, the cover of my book, which is from um, Mark um, Lafney's Pyrrhic Defeat, which is all about representing, representing imprisoned people other than how the state represents them as like bad subjects or criminals, offenders, you, through pejorative terms. And one, I think one of the strongest examples is this work by Russell Craig. It's a self-portrait. It's actually 10 feet by 8 feet. And it's, uh, it's, he made it when he was on parole. He went through and collected all his prison records and documents and used that as the backdrop for this elaborate self-portrait. Wow, that is amazing. And that's um, also, I love, Amanda had a good comment in there that she loved that prisoners had access to dark rooms because I'm shocked and in a great way because the- Yeah, that's a rare program, but I wanted to, I, I, you know, I wanted to show you an example where people did actually have access to photographic technology. In general, in prison, people don't have access to like photo, photography and video making. And it speaks so much too about like who has control of representation and right. what does exactly. that mean? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, love it. Thank you so much for that, especially the share was perfect. Um, my next one's gonna be for Amanda. So we did have a um, question concerning, I'll put you unmuted there, um, a question concerning the mechanics of shooting without bullets. And they were interested to know a little bit more about whether you give cameras to the youth that you're working with, and young adult technically, because we're looking at 18 to 21, if I'm not mistaken, so young adult, um, whether you give them cameras uh, to work with, um, or if, I think that's kind of the gist of it. And, and in addition to teaching them how to use that, whether they are able to have that camera like in their possession. Absolutely. Um... Shooting Without Bullets provides um, the cameras, the film, the arts and political education, the opportunities to exhibit in galleries, the curation, the instruction, the commissions, everything. Um, because we want to eliminate 
barriers in the arts and society for black and brown youth. Um, so yes, we, 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 do, we do it all. <laughs> um, and we're always accepting camera donations. We love 35 millimeter film and analog cameras because, um, because there's so much intention with using that tool. You know, you don't get to take a thousand shots, you have 36 frames, tell your story that way. Um, but also I think that in, you know, just in the art world, I, I do think that uh, a lot of the great photographers are practicing through traditional 35 millimeter in analog photography, but we're always accepting donations for that. We can never have too much film or too many cameras. Also equipment like lighting, studio lighting, we, we're open to and um, you can find uh, information on how to contact me on our website, shootingwithoutbullets.org. It's fundamentally important for, for, for our young people to have these tools, but we also do see it as an economic incentive and a tool of social mobility for them. And so having that camera is a way of having, um, having the ability to participate in the creative economy. And we actually teach young, um, black and brown youth 13 to 21, but 18 through 21, those in our artist collective, we believe that with the right training, the right opportunities and the right exposure that they can continue on their practices outside of shooting without bullets um, programming and enter into the arts ecosystem and creative economy when they're ready. It's just, it's such a remarkable system you've set up that you're going from the, such a young age to into the collective, which directly funnels into this creative agency. So it's not just providing skills that aren't hooked on to something. It's providing an entire pathway to self-exploration, community engagement, and also just this creative field. Um, for everyone, I put the Shooting Without Bullets link in um, the chat. So if you want to donate to their organization or find out more, please, please look. Um, and then also on our website, there are links to Barbara and also Nicole. So if you want to find out additional information, please, by all means, they're worth the time and the research for it. So what I'll do for it, this is going to be a question that I will throw to anyone who'd like to answer. So it is very interesting. It has to do with the idea of the interaction between the person taking the image and the subject. Where do we draw the line in society when we capture images and keep a moral balance of respecting one another? So to put it in other ways, do photographers, how do they act, have that balance between being respectful of a subject's autonomy and also still get their job done as a photographer of documenting and sharing these notions? So does anyone have any thoughts? It's almost like a privacy or limits of subject question. Yeah, we explore this a lot with shooting without bullets, um, the ethical implications of taking a photograph of someone who has not consented to being photographed. And I think that there are ways to do that, especially if it's from a documentary standpoint. But um, wherever we are able to, first of all, we're walking through our communities with our cameras. So the young people know their neighbors, they're photographing their friends and their families and their teachers and the, the, sh the corner store owners, et cetera. And so there's already relationship amongst the young people and the individual. And we see it as more of a participatory process, meaning the, the what people call subjects are actually participants in it. And, and uh, we're, we're trying to get better at this, but we wanna have a system in place where the people that we photograph, we do give images back to them. But sometimes when we're running around on the street, it's not really possible. But I think it's, do you understand the humanity of this individual, that they're not just something that has cool light shining on them, or they're not just wearing a cool coat, or they're, they're not just interesting figures in, in, the, in the, the, the landscape, like they're people. And, so I think that there has to be an intimacy and an understanding of their humanity and, um, and um, honoring their dignity in your photographic process, which I would say that a lot of photographers have some trouble with. Yeah, I would also say that there are different ways of working and it's not always street photography or sort of snapshots. There are, there are a number of photographers, especially people working on portrait or documentary series who actually consider the creation of the image as a collaboration. And they give their um, subjects a great deal of agency and involvement in how they choose to be photographed, when, where, why, 
Um, so there are different ways of working. I mean, one of the great things about photography is that it's such a varied field. And there's so many different uh, approaches and ways to, ways to use the medium. And some of them can be very collaborative and very participatory. Okay. So I, Nicole, did you have anything to add to that? Did you feel good with that? Yeah, I really liked it. And, you know, I have to say that Amanda was bringing up the issue of consent. I think that's always an ethical, you know, there, there's that around photography. And I also think about it in relationship to some of the collaborative pro projects and with my research on the people in prison, especially given that imprisoned people cannot legally consent. Oh. when they i mean their 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 status is as unfree people and so if you're unfree how can you actually legally consent to anything even if you say yes right and so and also especially for imprisoned people once a photograph of them is taken or they make art and they donate it to an organization they often have absolutely no control over how that work circulates so i do think that there's even more of an imperative that people who are involved with imprisoned people that they're that they think through the ethics of that work and that they're also that there's um as much transparency as can be communicated around that too because it it, it is um like actively going into situations and arrangements that are structured around inequality there's you know i mean that's what prisons do is they systemically reproduce inequality so incredibly well said and um, so we're actually, um, so it's, it flew by, but we are coming to the end of our, our closing. So I was wondering if any of the panelists had any uh, closing remarks before I threw it back to Christy and Mindy to end our time together. Does anyone have anything they would like to add? I just want to thank the, uh, the, all the other panelists for, um, for this conversation. Christy for doing an excellent moderation, really keeping us on task with just some fantastic questions and Megan and Mindy for all you've done to make this possible. Yeah, I agree 100% was gonna say the same thing, but you already said it and, and very well. <laughs> <laughs> I got a thumbs up from Amanda, the conciliar, thank you. Well, thank you so much, ladies. This has been amazing. I'm gonna go ahead and give this to Christy to draw the panel together. And then at the end, uh, when Christy's finished, she'll throw it to Mindy to do closing remarks. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that there were some more questions and answers, but um, feel free to, if anyone, I will put my email mm -hmm. in the chat and I would be happy to pass things along after the program since mm -hmm. we'll still have a couple more minutes. So thank you so, so much. And here we go to Christy Copas mm. to bring us home. Thank you. Um, I'm really hoping that this discussion today might cause each of us to not just look objectively or externally at our past and current world um, as we interact with these images, but it might compel us um, to search inwardly as uh, we no doubt will continue to encounter these images and videos of our community and country and the world as we know it. And if I may, let's be intentional about seeking out exhibitions such as Bridges and Barriers. I wanted to say thank you to our panelists. Um, Barbara Tannenbaum, thank you. Um, historian and curator, CMA. Nicole Fleetwood, author, educator, illuminator. And Amanda, activist, artist, and educator. Thank you to the Artist Archives Director and Curator of Bridges and Barriers, Mindy Towsley. And a very special thank you to the kindest person I know, Megan Oves, the Marketing and Program Manager, whom without her passion, this event would not have happened. And thank you, Kelly Pontoni, the Collector's Registrar, who is an invaluable and clever human that worked her magic to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, I just want to say thank you again to all the panelists and everyone for joining us. Um, I, I think this was amazing uh, discussion. I Unfortunately, my, my internet here kind of conked out in the middle, which is why we don't do these from the archives. Um, so I'm going to look forward to seeing the tape of this, which we will put up on the website as soon as we get that. Um, which I think one, someone had asked that in the chat too. So yes, you will be able to access uh, the tape of this panel discussion. 
Um, this had brought up uh, an amazing number of really interesting questions. And um, thanks everybody again. There's going to be a survey at the end when you sign off, when we leave the meeting. Um, so please do take the survey um, if you have participated in this. Uh, it's very important for us to get your opinions of what we're doing. And also, if you have suggestions for other programs, um, we do like to look at that and we do um, use that in making programs for uh, our next coming up year. Um, Thank you all so much. Everyone, please come in and visit Bridges and Barriers. It's a phenomenal exhibition. Um, there, it was reviewed by Stephen Litt in the Plain Dealer last Sunday's paper. And Megan is signaling me. She's got one more thing to say. Go ahead, Megan. I do. See, we work so well together. Mindy knows all of my cues. It's amazing. I would be remiss if I did not bring up that the archive. That was pretty obvious. <laughs> right, the sun that. Um, that the archives actually right now has what's called the archiving equity initiative. This equity initiative is imperative for overcoming financial and systemic barriers that prevent regional artists of color in Ohio from archiving their work. It's something that we're passionate about, of providing a more accurate and equitable representation of the amazing artists here in Ohio. If you're interested in finding out more about this, that's listed on the front page of artistarchives.org under our Archiving Equity Initiative. So thank you so much. That's my final piece. Thank you. Excellent piece. Um, so I guess we're going to say goodbye, everybody. It was a pleasure meeting, uh, meeting you, Nicole and Barbara. Nice seeing you again, Amanda, as always. Uh, look for Amanda in our next show coming up, too, about Body, About Face. And Christy Copez, I'm just going to give you a final plug. Christy has a show opening today while she is here on this panel at Worthington Yards. And I think the opening is going until 4 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. So everybody run out there and see her show.